afternoon to tell you about non practitioner collaborations in the administration of mental, mental health first aid and Thank you very much. We are group four. As a matter of fact, in our opinion, the best group of this class. We should minus ten. We we actually grouped it, we subtitled our topic, and I'm going to handle what I'm going to handle who are non-practitioners. And basically, it refers to the stakeholders around the victim. It might not necessarily mean the medical practitioners, but then it refers to supportive friends, acknowledged and registered support groups, family members, anybody that plays any supportive role in the life of the victim at that moment. Anyone that plays a supportive role with the right knowledge of help and resource at that moment. Like I said, it must not necessarily mean professionals. It could be sometimes the nanny in that family. Sometimes it could be a close friend. However, they are non practitioners that collaborate in handling this very important state of a human life. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking about collaborating with non-practitioners. So how do these non, how do practitioners collaborate with non-practitioners? First of all, I have um, a list here for mental health first aid. I will say, in the case of family members, we will ask them to tell us about symptoms they have seen or observe or what they observe in the beneficiary at least and all the victim. And would also ask for the pre-morbid states, meaning their behavior prior to when this um, mental health issue came about. And um, for drug addiction, would ask for the history, mental wellness prior to when they started using drug in order to justify if they were mentally stable or if there was a mental problem that led to drug use. And also, um, they provide them enabling conditions and um, environment. They provide good supportive relationships in order to aid their recovery. They, they would also help with the acknowledgement of improvements through rewarding maybe their successes from time to time and also urge them in using maybe their medications and things like that. So, yes. <laughs> okay, um, um, round up on our discussion, non-practitioner collaborations in administration of mental health first aid and addiction handling. My colleagues have talked about who a non-practitioner that we can collaborate with is and how we can collaborate with non-practitioners in mental health, first aid, and addiction handling. Now, when we are dealing with difficult non-practitioners, an example of a difficult non-practitioner can be a parent who is not accepting the issue that their child has, or a friend who is also having a similar issue and therefore declaring that it is not an issue, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? For mental health, health first aid, because first aid is an on-the-spot thing, remember that um, usually maybe the person is having a crisis at that moment and we need to intervene. The first thing we will do is attend to the patient. Make sure they are calm. When we have confirmed that they are calm and they are okay, we can now, when it comes to encouraging them to seek professional help, remember the OG, when we need to encourage them to seek professional help, we can then talk with 
the um, non practitioner that we're collaborating with. As for addiction handling, from the beginning, when they come, we're going to start interacting with the non practitioner that we're collaborating with. Remember that my colleague has referred to this non practitioner as members of the support system of the clients that we're dealing with. So, the first thing we do is find out what they know about this person's illness, this person's condition. Whether it's a mental, the mental illness or it's just, or it's um, use of substances. We ask what they know about it. We find out, we call it insights. What do they know about it? Do they understand that it is a problem? Do they agree that it is a problem? Have they started pursuing any other form of treatment? Have they tried to do anything on their own? After we deal with insights, we do psychoeducation. What this means is that we tell them about it. <laughs> if we have a, so a difficult, um, the, I give an example of a parent that is not accepting the issue. The parent, if you, you by the time you interact with the parent within a few sentences, you know whether they are logic, a logical person or maybe they believe everything is a spiritual matter. So if it is a logical person, one of the best things you can do is to get information from credible sites online and give to them to read. Once they get that information, if they are, log if they are logical people, they will start accepting and understanding. You know, logical people um, accept what they understand. So they will start accepting what you're telling them about. But let's assume that there are spiritual people, maybe the spiritual parents say, no, this is not true. Is these people that are my, father, my father's people, they're attacking my son, they're attacking my son. Then you help the person understand that. Even malaria is actually an attack from the enemy. And we can pray it away. But at the same time, how we pray it away, it's also important that we take medication that God has given us the wisdom and by the time you start talking with them on things like that, you can do a psychoeducation to help them understand the mental illness that they are, what is going through, and how they can administer first aid. You teach them how to deal with a crisis when, they, when the patient has a crisis, whether at home or wherever they are, on to, how to calm the person down and help the person before they take the person to the hospital. So that will be all. If there are any questions, I would like to answer. Thank you for listening to us from before.
background and brief statistics of Nigeria. Nigeria, most of us here are Nigerians, is a country with approximately an area of 924,000 square kilometers and a population of 107.117 million, according to WH reports 2005. The sex ratio men to women is 102, according to United Nations statistics. The, prop the proportion of the population under age 15 is 44 percent. Is 44 percent, and the proportion of population above the age of 60 is 5 percent. So what does that tell us? We have a, a literacy rate of about 74. The brief, we have a brief statistics of, we have held life expectancy at birth, so about 41 years for males and for 42 years for females. So during that period of childbirth and schooling and all, where the stress of life does happen, we have, we have people at risk in mental health concerning life issues and also pressures of life. We have our main languages where major uh, multilingual, we have a Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, and our local lingua, which is Pidgin English. The country is has a lower income group based on all by criteria and the proportion of our health budget to GDP is 3.4. According to a Vanguard report of as of 25th of September 2017, the per capita expenditure on health is $31, of which seven, seven is presented, which is captured in the system. 45 million Nigerians are likely to suffer adverse mental health related problems in their lifetime, given the life expectancy rate. There's, okay, okay, it's blocking it. That is approximately 20% of the population. One in every five persons is at risk of mental health. And this range from, this mental health can be caused from substance abuse, addictions, and various other things. You have to go up, please. And yes. Okay. So the life what what please keep going. Please keep going. Okay. Yeah. So and we know that um, we have learned about addictions and abuse already from, from alcohol and all things. So um, the health, mental health scenario in Nigeria, according to the manga document of September 25th, 45 million Nigerians are likely to suffer adverse mental health related problems in their lifetime. Um, that's 20% of the population. One out of every five in the society is at risk of this. From substance abuse to depression and psychosis. Medical practitioners under ages of society commonly decisions as so far, raised the alarm that 7 million Nigerians are living currently with depression and it poses a major risk factor in suicide and all other things. So there's a call for a well structured thing around mental health system and administrations. So, stress. Um, there exists a policy for mental health in Nigeria, the administration and the governance. We have that. Then we have mental health facilities in the six geopolitical zones of Nigeria, in form of um, physical centers, mental centers, and we have uh, psychiatric places in uh, uh, our general hospitals, and we have uh, psychiatric departments in the teaching hospitals. So we have all this. Mental health care has been spread across both the secondary and the primary health sectors. We have the mental health practitioners in different problems, either psychiatrists, uh, medical doctors, nurses, and psychologists. Then we have social workers, occupational therapists, and other mental health workers. There are mental health advocacies across the nation through NGOs, 
and other action groups. So, what are the weaknesses in the administration of so mental health? There's a consideration neglect of mental health issues in Nigeria, and as such, adequate information on mental health issues and system is grossly lacking. The existing mental health policy document in Nigeria was formulated since 1991. It was the first policy addressing mental health issues and its components includes advocacy, promotion, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. Though a list of essential medicines exists, they are not always available in the hospitals. No less exists in the ministries at any level for mental health issues. We only have about 4% of government yeah, expenses. 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 Opportunities. Okay, I'll just go to opportunities. The opportunities exist, which covers our weaknesses. One is what? Joining the team, Join of, the team of practitioners. Developing new policies. Yeah, building advocacy and what? Sensitizing. Sensitizing. And we have uh, more centers of this place. Thank you very much. There are press, strategic directions, general, for
to help your clients because if it's just free, 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 you may at the end of the day you feel unfulfilled and un unmotivated to keep doing what you're doing. So we also have discretion. This is the use of good judgment in honoring confidentiality and the privacy of others. Okay, so your client has shared something with you. You want to ensure that it is it, 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 it remains in confidence and you don't break such confidence and then uh, maybe make things worse than they were before you even came to the picture. Number five is competence. Okay, so, you know, we all know the level of what we've got into. We know our capacity. Somewhere in class, somewhere, some, somewhere not, we have in class. At least you know what you have gained. So that when it comes to you, you don't just say, oh, I am mental health, this is overwhelm yourself with, with, uh, with clients that you, know you cannot handle. So it's best for you to um, dispense your competence to the level you know you are capable of. And then, for us, it's on you to refer. Okay, to refer your clients when you know you cannot possibly handle it. So you can ask a question you are not able to handle. That is a pointer that you have exhausted your knowledge bank. Please, for your sake and your client's sake, refer to other competent uh, um, hands. So then we have um, the responsibility to refuse to carry out directly Anything that is illegal or unethical. So you're kind of something to you, and then in confidence, trying to help the person or aid the person to break the law. This is not acceptable. So, in all, let's ensure that uh, we have uh, a quality assurance process, which means when your client comes to you, you are able to uh, assure him of help, at least, that is help for you. The help may not lie with you, but at least there is help. Please give that hope, all right? Then involve qualified professionals with, with appropriate training, education, and license. Very important. Then share the message of hope, all right? This is important. And of course, um, treat the client's fa a family with respect, dignity, and fairness. Don't say because he's a psycho person. Ah, they are addicted to marijuana or to um, opium. Yeah, they are doing cocaine. Let's try to treat them with respect dignity and fairness. And of course, let's stay confidential in all our dealings. Let's get the client's consent. This also is an ethic that we need to have. Okay, that's the way where congruence comes in. Are you willing to be helped? Yes, you are willing to be helped. And also have a transition plan to a qualified professional. We are not yet professionals. So let's have that plan to transfer the person. And finally, it's on, also on us, to, um, to try and share this message with other people to also get qualified. So you have friends, you have a group that you have influence. Please let's encourage them as well as practitioners to also have them to also become aware of this form of education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful points there. Powerful group, right? And we will be presenting in the next class. Ma? We will be presenting in the next class because we will be in it. In the next class? Yes. <laughs> 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 That's a powerful <laughs> class. <laughs>